Hello everyone and welcome back to New Horizons. Today we continue the mission we set last episode to improve power storage, generation and transportation. This will be necessary as we add more machines and expand the base. First off, for power storage, the best thing we can afford at this moment is the Lapitronic Energy Orbs. These things can store 100 million EU. We were able to process down some platinum and used advanced circuit boards to craft 4 Lapitronic Energy Orbs. That's 400 million EU. Nice. Second is power generation. We are going to use benzene, which burns for 360,000 EU per cell, and run that through large gas turbines. The turbines we prepared last time and the only thing missing was the turbine rotor blades. We invested in the IV assembling machine and used HSSG to craft the next tier of EBF coils, giving us a higher heat capacity and greater discount on many of the EBF recipes. This also allows us to cook HSSS, which we mixed in the brand new IV mixer. The HSSS is the material we'll use for all the turbine blades, and with this configuration we should expect to see 7,956 EU from each turbine. That's over 1 amp of LUV power. And finally, power transportation. Well, that's something we'll discuss after we build somewhere for this setup to go. Yeah, so welcome back everyone. I'm really excited to get this project underway. It's been a lot of preparation. I've been doing a little bit of crafting between episodes. There's a few bits and pieces we'll need for the redstone logic later on. But yeah, I think we'll worry about that after it's built. Right now we need to design this space under here. It's looking very bland right now. And the general idea is we're somehow going to have the turbines lined up on each side of the wall. And there's going to be a lot of them in the future, so I want this room to be quite large. And then we'll have our battery system somewhere underneath this catwalk. And that way we can run the wires up these wiring tunnels. Hello, Creeper. Yeah, up the side of these wiring tunnels on both sides. And that can feed the rest of our base inside the valley. But yeah, we have a lot to get through today. Let's not waste any time. Let's do this. Alright, well, many thousands of blocks later, I think we arrive at something we can work from. We took a very boring old valley and filled it with some colour. I believe this is like the fourth or fifth iteration of this valley build, at least of this power room. It took me quite a while to get it the way I wanted, and there's still a few details missing. There's some things I'm not quite happy with and some other ideas I want to add, like for example adding painted glowstone to these pillars. I've already added quite a bit of painted glowstone around here just to try to repel some of the mobs. And the mobs are going to be a, a huge issue if we don't take care of them here early. Because the last thing we want to do is put our expensive turbines in here for them to be destroyed. That is absolutely not going to happen. But yeah, what I want with this base is actually to have strategic lighting so that we don't ever have to use night vision. It's very necessary right now because of hardcore darkness. But if we turn off night vision here, it's starting to actually get there. I really prefer playing without night vision. It gives you a lot more atmosphere in your builds, right? Especially when it's lit like this. This is awesome. Just imagine this place full of turbines and power cables overhead that are dyed. Oh, this is going to look awesome. And I think ever since the days I played vanilla, which wasn't that long ago actually, only last year, I fell in love with the red stained clay. That's what this block here is. Yeah, red terracotta and black. This, this is such a, a winning combination right here. This is awesome. Yeah, I'm liking this a lot, but we cannot have those guys dropping on our heads down there. <laughs> that is not going to happen. Is that another one? Oh, that's our friend. That's our friend, the Ender Creeper. He's gone. <laughs> that's what makes them so scary, is they just teleport away from you. You never know when they're going to show their head again. There he is. Can we get him? Nope. He does not... He... Nope. <laughs> we got him. Yeah, so what is the solution to all the mobs? I would like to invest in this advanced monster repel- Advanced monster repelator? Is that what that word is? I guess it's based off repel, but that doesn't- It doesn't sound right, does it? <laughs> Anyways, there's multiple different tiers. I think we go with the EV one, this gives us 52 range. Let's just craft one and, and find out, I guess. Yeah, we'll go for the EV one, it's not super expensive. I mean, it is kind of, the emitters are pretty expensive. 
Okay, so the way I understand these things to work is they don't prevent mobs spawning, but they don't allow mobs within their radius. Like this skeleton, for example. What happens if we place this here? Nothing? Nope. <laughs> Does it have to be powered? It says on the tooltip there, repels nasty creatures. Range is 52 unpowered and 208 when it's powered. Okay, we have an EV battery buffer here. I'm really... Uh... Is that a ninja skeleton? It is. Yeah, I'm really curious how these things work. So if we give this power, right? Now does it do anything? Don't tell me this thing doesn't work. Do we need to soft mal it? Okay, so it's been a few minutes. There doesn't seem to be any mobs after we cleared it out. And it is definitely nighttime right now. We're also missing a light right here. Yeah, and it is taking power out of the battery. It's slowly draining this thing. <laughs> so yeah, this is our solution. I guess it prevents mob spawns. Yeah, that is perfect right there. It will get the job done for today. Okay, so the turbines. I, I do believe we have all five large blades here from HSSE. I realized I said HSSS in the intro, but no, these are HSSE. Three million durability. We shouldn't ever have to really replace these things, at least not not for ages. <laughs> like it's going to be weeks IRL before we have to replace these. I also very briefly uh, touched on how we're going to transport power last episode. And we're actually going to use HSSG cable. So in preparation for that, let's start to make it all into wire. And let's assemble some turbines. We're going to do this in stages. Stage number one is the layout. I originally had it like this and left a one block gap. But we definitely want to make sure this is they're all within the same, the same chunk. And this one on the end here would have crossed a chunk boundary, and that is a no-no. And by the way, this whole room is also chunk aligned. Same as the rest of the base. Oh no, we appear to be short some casings. We can place down all the maintenance hatches, which are going to go on the left-hand side. Machine controllers are going to go front and center. Again, we're using the EV buffered dynamo hatches, which can allow 4 amps of EV output. I believe these things have to go on opposite the controller. Alright, we are back with some more casings and also muffler hatches, which go on the top side. Actually, correction according to the controller goes on the side. Alright, so I guess we put the mufflers on opposite to the maintenance hatches. And then next to the mufflers, we'll have the input hatches. And this is where the benzene is going to be inserted to. Yeah, and I believe that's all we need for the casings and the hatches, etc. The rest just has to be casings, and it should form the multi-block. Yes, perfect. Okay, so we got ourselves five gas turbines. But this was the easy bit. Are you guys ready to get nerdy? <laughs> this is where things start to get a little bit complex. Wait, this one is still in complete structure. Did I miss a casing? I did miss a casing. Okay, so before we can get into any of the logic, we have some checklist items which we have to make sure we collect. And the first of which is actually an item from Thomcraft. Oh, and our boots of the Traveler are dangerously low. We'll have to repair those things. But we actually also need an Earth Shard. We're at a Vitreous. Yeah, one of the shards we can put through the lathe to make into a rod. And then the other one we can convert to a sliver of earth. And this allows us to convert the regular red crystals, which just basically acts like redstone dust you can put on the wall, into the dense red crystals. We are also going to need some way to do wireless redstone. And we have used wireless redstone before in our chemistry room here. The problem with these things is we're not reading a fluid amount. It's not the fluid detector we need. Well, it is. We, we do actually need to read the benzene levels. But what we actually need is the energy energy detector cover, which we don't have. And of course, we cannot actually make here because it's one of those uh, <laughs> extremely tedious recipes with the dye. Okay, after some crafting, we got the energy detector cover. And the way that we'll do wireless redstone is actually using the old school method, the transmitter and the wireless receiver. And these devices actually take a tungsten steel rod each, <laughs> which is a mighty expensive way to send a wireless redstone signal. Okay, so we got the receiver. We'll need two of these eventually, only one today, but yeah, we'll, we'll make up two at least. And then also the transmitter. Okay, and to go along with these devices, we also need some, f or just one fluid detector cover, five machine controllers, one for each turbine, 
We'll need some red alloy wire, ideally a little more than this. We'll have to craft an RS latch. We'll need a knot gate, a repeater, a vanilla repeater should work for this. Oh yeah, and we also need the red alloy insulated cable. And this can allow us to go vertical with the red alloy wire without having to give it any support. So we it does it means that we can wait, really? That was a quest. It means that we don't have to place it on a block. It can actually be freestanding. Okay, I think finally the last two items is gonna be a super tank of some description. And also five fluid regulators. So I've went ahead and given us an applied energistics connection. And the first thing we're gonna do is actually hook up the benzene inputs to these turbines. So this one here is connected to our main controller. We'll have another P2P here, which is connected to the super tank. We'll change this to a fluid P2P and join this up to the P2P benzene. We should see this tank fill up now, which we do, perfect. And this may be a little bit overkill, but we're actually gonna use steel fluid pipes. In fact, this is definitely overkill, but it looks nice. So we'll go with steel. And these will run to all of the input hatches. We could save a few if we actually join them up like this, but I want it to be more symmetrical. So for the sake of keeping things consistent, we'll make sure they're all on the right hand side next to the muffler hatches. And we'll have to make sure we use the shutters on the pipes so that the benzene only flows in one direction. You know what, I think I say this every single time, but this is so satisfying. <laughs> Connecting up GT pipes is just the best thing in the world. I never ever get tired of doing this, it's awesome. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we want them all shorter to the left on this side of the super tank and shorter to the right on this side. And before we allow any benzene to flow from the tank, what we actually wanna do is regulate how much benzene we give it. And we can do that using the fluid regulators, which we're gonna put directly on the input hatches. Uh, here, one for each turbine. So now we need to determine how much benzene we have to give it per second. And inside the fluid regulator, we can, we can specify that exact value. But how do we find that value? Well, if we grab one of the turbines here, we can see here that the energy from the optimal gas flow is 8160 EU per tick. That's theoretically the maximum amount of EU that you can generate from HSSE rotors inside a gas turbine, which is of course what we're using. Then we can also look at the turbine efficiency. For us, it's 170%. So if we do 8160 divided by 170, that should give us 48. And then if we look at the benzene, which is the fuel we'll be burning, this burns for a fuel value of 360,000. We have to find how much one millibucket gives us. And of course, a cell is a thousand millibuckets, so this is uh, 360. So every millibucket of benzene gives us 360 EU. We can then take that 48 value and divide by 360. It's going to give us 0.13. So this is our number right here, 13. 13 millibuckets. And then just in case you were curious how we arrive at that 7956 number, once you figure out the flow rate, which is 13 millibuckets, you can do 13 times 360 since we're running benzene times by 1.7. And the 1.7 number is the turbine efficiency. And this number should equal 7,956. Our magic number, this is the, the EU we should generate at maximum efficiency if we feed these things with 13 millibuckets of benzene per, per tick. Yeah, and that formula should work on any sort of material or fuel value. And I believe it's also the same on the combustion engines, the multi-blocks. Although the XL is slightly different. That has a different form formula, but any of the large gas turbines, large combustion engines, the, the formula there should work to figure out the flow rate and the EU value. So yeah, now that we know the fuel value, we want to feed this thing 13, minus 13 since it's input. And we should be good to go, right? We can just turn these things on and hope for the best. Certainly not. <laughs> Definitely not. We still have to make sure we want to actually generate power. What happens if the battery is full? Well, first of all, we do actually have to craft the battery buffer. We're gonna go for a 16X insane voltage uh, battery. We do only have four orbs right now, Lapidronic energy orbs, but this will give us some room for expansion to add more batteries in the future. As I'm guessing that is gonna be necessary before we can get the Lapidronic super capacitor, the multi-block battery. So yeah, this thing is gonna be placed right in the center here. I believe it's this block. Uh, we'll place it one below the catwalk. 
here. That doesn't look centered, does it? I think it is, though. <laughs> yeah, and from here, we'll, we'll, this will be our main power spine. So once we put in the batteries, this will effectively give us four amps of IV output. And we'll run these cables uh, underneath the catwalk and then up the wiring tunnels up here and feed the rest of the machines in the base. But yeah, to make sure we control these correctly, we're going to use the machine controller on the machine controller on uh, the bottom side so we can easily send a redstone signal to each of the turbines. And the other thing to know about these things is they do have a, a startup time, so to say. I don't think it says here in the quest, but it, it does mention briefly about the efficiency rating. And it's not the same as the efficiency rating of the rotor. This is the efficiency of the multi-block itself. Think of it like the clean room efficiency, where when you turn it on at first, it, the turbine spins slower and generates less power. But if we're right on the edge of the threshold for the battery buffer, we don't want this thing to keep flickering the machines on and off. Because what's going to happen is, let's say we set this threshold at 100,000, and then let's say we craft a few stainless steel plates, and that craft that takes off a tiny amount of energy from the bu the battery. Then the machines turn on and start to spill up, but then it instantly reaches the threshold again, and then the machines turn off, and it's never it never reaches maximum speed of the turbine. So basically, we want to turn the the turbines on when this hits a certain percentage, i.e., twenty percent, and only turn them off again once it reaches eighty percent in the battery buffer. And that should prevent us from flickering the machines and allow them to speed up to maximum efficiency and maximum turbine speed to make sure that we maximize the amount of EU that we get from the benzene that we give these things. Are you guys still following? <laughs> yeah, so to achieve that, we want the energy detector cover and this will measure the amount stored in the battery buffer. So we want electricity storage, including batteries. This will be on zero and normal. And then we can run that framed red alloy cable I think we actually need an extra piece of red alloy wire here to connect it together. And then we're going to run this underground. We'll have to move the repilator. Am I saying that right? I, I, I don't think I'm saying that right. And actually, we need to replace the battery here. So what we want to do is basically work off the signal strength. So the energy detector cover outputs a signal strength proportional to how full the battery buffer is. And then we're going to send that ultimately into a, a wireless transmitter. And this will be sent to the turbines to turn them on or off. But we only want to activate this thing if it's under 20% uh, full. And only turn it off if it's over 80%. Or around those numbers. It's not going to be absolutely precise. So we're going to work with two signals here. Actually, the first one is going to be a dense red crystal. And the dense red crystal allows you to specify exactly what signal strength you want it to output to. Or no signal at all. And that is important. So basically, we can say if this is above uh, 11 and this is our 80% value if it's above 11 we want to send a signal to the RS latch and the latch does well it, yeah it latches the signal right oh and you know what we're missing a screwdriver here this one the project red screwdriver and we want to make sure we change the mode of the RS latch uh, shift right click this one so this prevents the signal from going backwards there is ways to get around that if we want to use a repeater. We could put a repeater here to keep the signal going one way. And then the other side here, we want to make sure we invert, so we use a knock gate. We could use a redstone torch, just a vanilla redstone mechanic. This is just another way to invert the signal. And then this we can send into the RS latch. We'll use redstone dust so we can see the, the power levels in the tooltip. And this one, we want another dense red crystal set to two. Yeah, redstone signal strength minimum set to... Wait, how do you change it back down? You have to go all the way through. So yeah, again, this only lets a redstone signal through when it's signal strength 2, and then it's inverted. And this only lets it through if it's above 11, or 11 or higher, and it's not inverted, hits the redstone latch, and then goes to the transmitter. We then want to receive that redstone signal over here at the super tank. I'm going to make sure we set a frequency here. We'll use frequency 3. And once we set the receiver to three, we can also see it's receiving a redstone signal. So now before we send it to the turbines, we want to make sure we take into account the benzene levels. So basically we need an AND gate on this, which I forgot to craft. But yeah, we want a fluid detector cover. And along with making sure the battery is empty or empty enough, we also made to want to make sure the super tank is full enough. So, after wiring up the rest of the redstone, there was a few more components I 
did actually forget about. We're also going to need some transformers, and I also made the HSSG cable that we require. All that's left to do is connect the fluid pipes together, and we're ready for the first test here. Oh yeah, let's make some electricity. So yeah, as you can see here, I did complete the redstone circuit. Whenever we're above 10 buckets in the super tank, that's combined with the redstone signal from the battery. And if both of those are true, the battery is empty enough, the tank is full enough, it sends the signal up this wire, and this goes to all of the blocks underneath the machine controller. We're actually missing a wire right here. These are just repeaters to extend the signal. Don't actually think these are necessary. And then all of the turbines obey our own golden rule, which is redstone on, machine on. And yeah, you can see the redstone right here. It should pass through this block into the machine controller. All the pipes are connected. We also have transformers directly on the buffer hatches, the dynamo hatches. So we have EV dynamo hatches. This transforms up to one amp of IV and we're transforming immediately. I was thinking about putting a single transformer further down the line, but this makes things so much more simple. So pretty much each one of these things are gonna give us just shy of one amp of IV power. But with the way these transformers work, I believe it should only output a full amp. So pretty much we're getting a full amp of IV from each one of these turbines, which is not bad at all. And that goes into 2X HSSG cable. Now the HSSG is actually LUV to your cable. It will happily accept IV power though, just not the other way around. You can put higher tier power in a lower tier cable, but the other way around will end up in a fire. <laughs> and we do not want fires or explosions here. But yeah, the reason I chose HSSG is because it's slightly cheaper than if we use tungsten steel, which is our equivalent IV tier wire. We could also use platinum, but we're not exactly rich on platinum. And this is gonna feed directly into this battery buffer. Oh yeah, and we're using 2X cable here. So maximum amperage is, is eight amps. And there's also a loss of two EU per block. <laughs> and if you guys are about to suggest, why don't you just do wireless energy? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, we can forget about wireless energy ever. Like this is not, even, even this one, which is ULV, Look at this, this is <laughs> ameliorated superconductor coil. Do we even want to, no. <laughs> yeah, cable loss is not something we can avoid right now and only two EU is actually really, really good. So one final double check here, everything should be connected. Make sure these are all in step up mode. And this is the output face. We do not want the power to go, IV power to go into the buffer. That would be very bad. Output, perfect. Double check these fluid regulators. They should, should all be on minus 13. Oh, and something we should have crafted a very long time ago is the GregTech scanner. This thing, the portable scanner. We're just missing a few MV components. Please tell me we have, oh no. We can make the emitter. The sensor, we need a flawless, M wait, can't we buy that? I'm sure I've seen that in the shop, right? Yes, perfect. 16 technician coins, we can do that. A very useful scanner, yes indeed. I think we have to charge this though. It has to be charged in an HV machine. Oh no, this is actually an MV, yeah. Okay, so now let's connect the fluid pipe. This should give benzene to all the turbines. I'm gonna wait on the buffer filling a little bit before we give the redstone signal. Did I enable automatic output? I didn't. Yeah, that's right, I switched this out with a super tank one. I, I used to have a super tank two here. We just don't really need that much buffer on location. Yeah, once we enable input here, there we go. Uh, yes, it took a second, but yeah, they're all filling up with benzene and we should have plenty of buffer to test with. Oh, this is so exciting. <laughs> okay, we have done a backup. Connecting this wire is gonna put us uh, on the grid. Okay, are we ready? Let's do this. Redstone signal. Do we see turbines? Yes. <laughs> nice, okay. So now if we scan them, it's gonna tell us how much EU we're generating here. Yeah, you can see here generating 1500. That's nowhere near 7,000, but that is the startup cost that I talked about, or the spool up time, I guess you could say for the turbines. If we keep scanning them, we're gonna see more and more EU. Yeah, 4,000, 5,000. They're gonna slowly cap out at 7,956. 6,000, wow, this is actually fast. Oh yeah, and there's a, a percentage speed right here. So 79.5. It's now 100 and we, yeah, we see the golden number right there. 7956. 
Perfect. So are we getting energy in the battery buffer? Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, this is so cool. Okay, we're filling the battery buffer. Awesome. So now all we have to do is wait and make sure this thing actually turns itself off, right? And I'm not sure exactly what number that's going to happen at. Again, it's based on the signal strength, but it should flip the RS latch once it reaches a signal strength of 11. Maybe just so we can see what's going on, let's add a redstone dust. And we can see in the tooltip here, it's power three. And once it reaches 11, it should turn itself off because this signal is going to turn itself on and flip the latch, turning off the signal and turning off the turbines is the hope anyway. Oh yes, <laughs> this looks awesome. Nice. Yep, 25 million, that's about a quarter full. And how are we for benzene? Yeah, we've got plenty of storage. And we have lots of benzene backlog not even connected to applied energistics. But yeah, we managed to get the first of many turbines here. This is just the start. This is just the beginning. Eventually, all this place is probably going to be filled with turbines of some description. Whether it's gas or plasma or combustion, I'm not sure yet. We will see. So it's been a while later, I added some extra details to this room and everything appears to be working exactly as intended. So it actually didn't take too long for the turbines to turn themselves off. I think it was around 68 or 69 million. And then there was some residual energy still left in the battery buffers or in the transformers and the dynamo hatches. But that is actually ideal, that's exactly what we want. Since if it was 100%, then there would be some energy voided. This way we don't lose any power. I'm just not exactly sure when it's going to turn itself back on or if it's going to turn itself back on because we don't have any power consumers to actually test that theory. But yeah, there's actually a new cable in here now, the HSSG1X cable. It's not plugged in at the moment, but yeah, it doesn't really have anywhere else for it to go. But this runs directly adjacent to or directly above the 2X input cable, which eventually is going to input from the two sides. But yeah, for the moment, the input cable just runs along here and the output cable is directly above that. We definitely do not want to mix these cables up. I think we might have a solution for that though. But uh, yeah, first I did actually add some more detail to the wall here. Nothing super special. I wanted to keep it not too busy. So I just added some stairs to give it some shape around the windows, not windows, <laughs> around the lights. Yeah, it's nothing super fancy. And there's also some extra painted glowstone here. We still have to decide what we want to do below us though. And you guys might have uh, heard me saying that I have a plan for underneath here. Well, that plan has been scrapped in favor of this power room. It was originally, this space was um, originally meant to be kept for a rocket museum, which we still may or may not build on the opposite side now. Or maybe this side, I'm not sure yet. But yeah, I, I figured as soon as I started to prototype this idea, there wouldn't really be space for both the power and the rockets underneath. So if you guys have any ideas for down at bedrock here, then uh, let me know. But uh, for now, it's just going to be an empty space <laughs> for the wiring and the logic. But yeah, overall, I'm really, really happy with how this turned out. I'm missing a stair there as well. I knew I was missing one. I just caught that out of the court. I'm going to be catching those all day. <laughs> Is there any others? I don't think so. So to finish this off today, I would like to establish a color scheme. And this color scheme is going to be for all of the future wiring around the base. Since now we're going to be running power cables, we need a way to distinguish between them easily since, you know, there could be, well, there will be situations where we have to run HV and MV cable adjacent to each other. And we definitely don't want to plug these in, especially when they are live. So I believe the item is called the spray can. There's the Greg Tech spray, yeah, these ones. Empty cell and a redstone circuit one. Yeah, so now we have to decide which tier gets what color. We can't scroll up in this, no, we have to delete the lines. So I was thinking LV is going to be grey. I don't know if there's an ideal way to do this. I think a lot of people actually use the superconductor coil colours or superconductor wire colours. And the supercons are the lossless cable at each tier. So they're pretty consistent with uh, the colour. To me though, it's not really super intuitive. 
since like for example um luv is orange and i would normally associate orange with mv i don't know why that is maybe it's because of the copper cable it uses a lot of copper in mv even though the machine hull is aluminium which is blue yeah i suppose the best way is just whatever makes sense to you and for me it's going to be as follows lv is going to be gray mv is orange hv is going to be blue EV is going to be pink because of titanium. IV is going to be white. What's after IV? LUV is going to be lime. Then we have ZPM. I'm not sure what ZPM is going to be. It's either going to be black or red. I'm not sure about that, but it's going to be a while before we have to run ZPM cable. So yeah, this seems like a pretty sensible color order to me. It's very similar to season one. I would have to go back to double check that. In fact, it might be exactly the same. I'm not sure. But yeah, now that we have the spray cans, we have to actually fill these with uh, the specific dyes. And to do that, it's salt, plus the color of dye, plus sulfuric acid. And it should run in the chemical reactor here to give us chemical orange dye. This one is for MV, of course. And then inside a chemical bath, I actually had to do this for the hardened clay. I was way out in the, in the mesas trying to find hardened clay. <laughs> and the reason I was way out there is because... Uh, well, you can't actually craft red stained clay. Yeah, it's got it's got the old Minecraft name, the red stained clay, and not terracotta in this version. But yeah, look at this. The only way you can craft it is with regular clay, which we do not have in very large quantities right now. Or you use a chemical bath with the default hardened clay. And we we only have the colored variants from this mess up. There's no regular hardened clay that spawns anywhere near here. Yeah, and to craft this version, you either have to do it again from clay, or you can use a chemical bath with chlorine. So not exactly the easiest thing to get. Easy is just to mine it. But yeah, for now we want to just fill the cans. I'm not sure how much fluid it takes. Oh, it's not a chemical bath, it's a fluid canning machine. Aha, uh -huh. well we do have one of those, I'm pretty sure, right? Is it this? Yeah. We use this a lot for the energy hatches and things. Yeah, there we go. Oh, and look at that, there's even some more nat coolant here that's spare. Nice, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to take that. Okay, so we got the orange, we got MV. I'm going to try to make a few spares of this as well, actually, if we can. Uh, maybe not for orange, though. I think we just have to pick a few more dandelions. I'm sure there's an easier way to get this, but... Uh, <laughs> we only need a tiny bit here. Alright, and some die crafting later. I believe we've got all the colours. And I did actually manage to get two of every can. Yeah, there's six different colours, LV to LUV. I suppose we actually missed out ULV, maybe that one can be red, but honestly I don't know how how often we're going to be running ULV cables, if ever. That, that's going to be a, an extremely rare occurrence. But yeah, sticking to our own rules, IV is going to be white, so basically all of these cables are going to be white. Since all of this is IV power, even though that it's LUV cable, we're going to go based on what uh, power tier is actually in the cable. Uh oh. Oh, not usable when stacked. Okay, now it should work, right? Yes, there we go. And it has 512 uses. That's honestly not a whole lot. But I mean, they are fairly cheap to produce, I suppose. Kinda glad I made some spares. And this is also super satisfying. <laughs> Very tedious to craft these things, but super satisfying. So yeah, all of this cable is gonna be white. And yeah, I'm hoping this is gonna save us later down the line when we have loads and loads of cables all sharing the same confined space. I want to get all these out as well. Makes me a little nervous these are together. I may actually lower this one block, but uh, it's not very often we're going to be tinkering with this wire. And even if we do, we're going to make sure we disconnect the ends. Make sure we're not working with live cable, especially here. And we need somewhere to place... I guess we use the backpack. I need to clean all this stuff out. But uh, anyways, guys, I think with that, that is also a good point to wrap up. Hello. <laughs> he's back from the beginning oh he's, this guy's infernal this guy is infernal he does not care poisonous gravity regen i think is what i've seen yeah it's a little tip tough to see because of the tooltip oh, no. <laughs> yeah he definitely is gravity <laughs> anyways guys that is gonna do us for this episode thank you guys so much for watching and i hope to see you all in the next episode of new horizons have a fantastic day everyone